This week on Security Weekly, we're going to talk about all sorts of fun stuff from hard coded passwords, memcached, and the history of the loft. Let's take it away. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Azadorian. Excited to be here, as always, on Paul's Security Weekly. Hi, and welcome to the show. I totally introduce our host right now, but I've got a totally awkward boner. What? We're... Oh, hey! I'm, I'm in the studio with you guys. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a plan. And we'll at least have one person listening. That's right. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah I, I know. And I appreciate it. And I, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed your spooning with Jeff. But, uh, you know. Hey, that's it. Actually built a new office. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, third baby on the way, so I needed a new office. Nice. I, I, I lost my old office. That's now the baby room. Brought to you by... NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. In 2017, an increasing number of companies reported they did not have effective insider threat detection methods. Logarithm's UEBA solutions enable you to detect and neutralize user-based threats in real time, while built-in scenario and behavior-based analytics empower you to expose insider threats, compromised accounts, and privilege misuse. Visit Logarithm.com to learn how their UEBA solutions can help you expand visibility and enhance detection capabilities. Welcome to the show. Let me introduce you to a man who has more holes than anybody knows what to do with. Larry Pesci. Hey, I can certainly find a use for every one of them. (laughs) 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 Uh, Thank you. And welcome to Security Weekly, episode 554, March 8th, 2018. I will be your host tonight. And Mr. Asadorian is, well, not here, unfortunately. Sorry. Oh, well, you're stuck with me. Too bad. But let me introduce you to our uh, illustrious co-host for the evening, Mr. Keith Hoodlet. Hey, hey, hey. Very glad to be here. It's yeah. been a few weeks since I, uh, I was on last, but uh, when the cat's away, the uh, the mice come out to play, so it's going to be a good week. Yes, we even had pineapple on our pizza and all the fun stuff that can be had when are you now writing code with tabs instead of spaces like has you know cats and dogs sleeping together <laughs> but yes and we're using emacs to do it oh god okay that's it i'm out <laughs> <laughs> yes yes i we uh, i i hear we'll be uh potentially joined by mr joe fire a little bit later uh in the show but we'll see if he actually makes it uh, uh allegedly he'll be here for some of our news stories and such so Let's get right to it. Uh, we've been uh, having our uh, guest interview wait patiently, and let's, uh, let's make sure he has his time to talk here. But uh, really quickly, a uh, couple of uh, announcements. Uh, real quick, IT Pro TV forward slash Security Weekly uh, with the code Security Weekly 30 to try uh, it free for, 30, uh, for seven days, and then you can get 30% off your uh, monthly membership um, or your lifetime uh, subscription and so forth. Um, and also... One that I'm going to read verbatim, and I want to make sure I get this right. So, today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their backdoors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable even junior annualists to detect even the most advanced backdoors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash PSW. Active Countermeasures. Make every analyst a hunter kind of cool all right without further ado let's get into our featured interview uh with stefano Rihi. hopefully i said it right <laughs> he's sort of smiling so i might have got it close um uh stefano's um, been in the industry a really long time uh with over 35 years of experience in research and development um 
a holder of many pants, I mean patents, uh, it, it, 22 uh, confirmed kills and uh, 8 future. Uh, so 22 patents uh, plus 8 more pending. Uh, and it does lots of, of lots of fun stuff. Uh, he's currently uh, representing AMI on the UE UEFI Forum Board of Directors and serves on the UEFI Security Response Team, uh, amongst other things. Stefano, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's good to have you. Um, so uh, we have a list of questions for you, and we're gonna, you know, have lots of fun, lots of fun doing it. Um, the the first one, I that we have a question that we sort of ask all of our all of our guests. Um, and, and while yours specifically isn't necessarily directly always related to security, how did you get your start in the industry? My start in the industry uh, goes back to uh, 1984 when I took my uh, first job at uh, in a, a nice little town in Italy called Ivrea, uh, where uh, that is the headquarter of uh, Olivetti. That was uh, uh, an Italian company uh, doing uh, personal computer. So I joined Olivetti in 1985, and uh, um, I surely uh, enjoyed the year that I have spent uh, uh, into Olivetti until uh, Olivetti took a downturn, and uh, uh, I moved to uh, a company mainly focusing on industrial automation. Until in 1999, I decided to take uh, uh, a shot to American Megatrends, uh, and I came to the U.S. Excellent. Uh, so you've been with uh, American Megatrends for quite some time, obviously. It's, uh, 19 years today. 19 years today? Yes. Well, happy anniversary, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, at AMI, uh, sorry, at American Megatrends, uh, you're, you're involved in some very specific types of uh, types of things. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Uh, uh, in AMI, I um, uh, cover more than one hat, uh, and I could say that uh, from the research and development point of view, I, uh, uh, my team is working on uh, uh, setup, uh, setup engine, uh, pre-boot application, uh, and uh, a, uh, um, I represent AMI in uh, uh, industry standard group like uh, UEFI, and uh, I uh, also lead the uh, security vulnerability team uh, that uh, uh, address uh, uh, vulnerability found uh, on uh, uh, BIOS problem. Very cool. Very cool. So. We have all ranges of, of listeners on our show from, from seasoned veterans to, to folks that are looking to, to make a jump into security mm -hmm. and are even uh, some uh, system admins as well. Um, so to give them a little bit of background, tell us about UEFI and, and, and what UF, UEFI is all about. Uh, the, the, the most cool thing on UEFI, I think, start with the first selector. UEFI stands for a Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, and this means that it is a, a, a collaboration of uh, several players in the industry in order to come up uh, with uh, 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 specification for firmware. And uh, as you can imagine, is uh, uh, practically the, 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 uh, the place where the brightest mind uh, uh, that uh, uh, exists in the world for uh, firmware work together and uh, 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 so uh, the, the, the area that are covered by uh, UEFI are both uh, UEFI specifications that are behind the uh, uh, interfaces that have uh, firmware exposed to the uh, uh, operating system for booting, for, for, uh, uh, booting and uh, uh, runtime services purposes. But uh, UEFI also hold uh, other, uh, um, other working group, like, for example, the SCPI working group, Advanced Configuration uh, um, and uh, uh, Power Management, uh, that uh, is another very important interface uh, uh, that uh, firmware exposed to the operating system. Um, and also uh, are also part of UEFI, uh, also the platform initialization uh, spec that are practically the specification that uh, uh, control the plumbing between uh, 
uh, the various uh, uh, firmware component that uh, collaborate for the uh, initialization of the system. Excellent, excellent. So, thinking about UEFI, you know, what type of problems is is UEFI uh, solving that that we didn't know there was an actual issue? I mean, uh, uh, just uh, uh, considering what is this uh, podcast for, <laughs> I could say that security is one of the uh, most important points that uh, uh, UEFI as a, a, a specification is addressing. Um, UEFI has introduced in uh, 2010, so just five, under, five years after the foundation, has uh, uh, introduced the secure boot uh, 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 um, uh, specification that uh, allow to implement uh, a, a chain of trust uh, starting from the root of trust that uh, reside uh, uh, into the uh, into the silicon, bringing this uh, uh, chain of trust up to the uh, operating system, providing to the operating system a a, 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 um, a platform that. Uh, uh, is secure because uh, all the components, all the software components that are running into it uh, has been properly measured before giving, giving control to them. Interesting, interesting. So le- let me uh, sort of, you know, uh, diverge a little bit from, from some sure. of that. <clears throat> and that, and that's, uh, my, so my question would be, and me not knowing a lot about UEFI, does this mean that, so not only do we you provide the secure boot functionality, is that we can now use UEFI to only boot known good operating system images? Uh, for example, say, uh, make it so we can't take our Apple iPhone and run Linux on it. That's something that UEFI can accomplish. Okay, uh, uh, secure boot uh, uh, is uh, uh, rooted on uh, a, a, a database of uh, uh, of keys that uh, are used to identify uh, uh, the, the to to uh, validate the source of the uh, um, of the software that is executed. So uh, it is not limiting by any means. Uh, it is only providing uh, uh, the, the the user the ability to ensure the uh, source of the bootloader that uh, uh, is going to be uh, uh, used uh, uh, into the system. And uh, this doesn't preclude uh, uh, to uh, use different bootloader as long as they are properly uh, properly signed. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Now I understand. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. So thinking about you know the history, the, the, the long history I've had with, well, maybe not as long as some other folks, my, my history with computers, um, UF, UEFI is sort of a, a new thing for me. So how long has this actually been around and, and a viable product? Uh, so uh, UEFI uh, uh, as uh, an industry group uh, is, uh, uh, has been founded in 2005, uh, bringing into the uh, consortium, uh, into the group, uh, um, uh, EFI specifications that are dated, uh, um, that are, uh, let me say, edited by Intel and were uh, uh, published in 1999. So we are we are talking about uh, 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 quite a bit of history. But uh, uh, and let me say that after the foundation and uh, the, uh, uh, let me say that the, the real uh, presence into the marketplace, uh, you can, uh, um, uh, you can sync it with the uh, starting of Windows 8, so uh, 12, um, 20, 2012. That was the time in which uh, uh, we could see the first uh, operating system really making use of, of uh, uh, Secure Boot. Excellent, excellent. So, Keith, feel free to jump in at any point here uh, as well. Um, yeah, I actually had one question going back just a, a moment, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. Um, I was curious to know uh, if you you can tell us more about like how UEFI would know that a bootloader is is signed or like how a bootloader gets signed. Um, just because there are open source bootloaders and and of course there are bootloaders for um, say Apple iOS or Mac OS and and Windows and what have you. I'm just curious to know uh, if there's anything you can tell us more about the the signing process or the checking for that signing. 
Sure. Uh, absolutely. The, uh, uh, the uh, secure boot uh, is really rooted uh, into a uh, combination of uh, uh, protected variables that are part of the, uh, uh, of the firmware itself. Uh, the root of them is what is called the PK or the platform key that uh, uh, contain the public key of the uh, uh, motherboard manufacturer. On, on, uh, uh, um, after this, we have what is called the CAC or key exchange key that is uh, uh, the, the, um, that contain the, uh, var the, the, the public key uh, signed with uh, the, uh, uh, the PK that uh, uh, can uh, uh, give, the, that give the possibility to uh, add uh, um, key into what is called the DBE of the database of the good keys or into the DBX that is the database of the, uh, of the bad keys. So as long as uh, the, uh, when the bootloader is evaluated, uh, the, uh, its signature is uh, uh, verified against uh, uh, the public key stored into the, uh, uh, into the database of keys. And uh, uh, as long as the signature is uh, properly identified through the usage of the public key, then the bootloader is given control to. Now, um, in, uh, uh, in, in your system, uh, uh, you have the possibility to uh, uh, inject uh, 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 your own key as long as, uh, 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 as long as uh, uh, you are physically present uh, into the uh, uh, into the system, and this allow you, for example, to uh, inject uh, uh, into your database of key a key that you may use to self sign your bootloader, and this practically enable you to uh, uh, verify that uh, uh, only the bootloader that you want to launch is really getting control when secure boot is up, turned on. So that would probably explain then for certain architecture why you have to overwrite the firmware on the motherboard first before you can install something like a Linux variant because the key doesn't exist at the time for you to do a straight installation. So you have to first overwrite the boot or overwrite the UFI secure boot functionality to allow for your key to then be in place so you can actually do the installation. Is, am I following correctly? Uh, uh, override means uh, that you want to turn secure boot off. Yeah, I, I suppose that would probably be the case. I know that in most cases, at least in my experience from old laptops, you had to turn off secure boot to actually then do like a Linux installation. Um, so that would be why you would have to do that. Is, is that accurate? Uh, uh, that is one possibility, but uh, surely there are most of the distribution today uh, 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 signed uh, the, uh, uh, signed their bootloader so that uh, with the UEFI certificate authority, so that uh, <coughs> the public key corresponding to uh, those uh, signed bootloader is already uh, is already present into the uh, into the system, and you can install without having to disable anything. Gotcha, gotcha. That's good to know. That's that's really useful, and it's um it's interesting because the firmware side of things is always kind of like uh if you do it wrong, you can mess things up. And so whenever they tell you to overwrite <laughs> firmware on a device, I'm always a little leery. <laughs> so it's good to know. Yes. <clears throat> yes, and, and and that brings up some of the uh, the other the other questions that uh, that I know that we, we we've got. Um, you know, so what makes UEFI different than than some of the other more traditional uh bioses and you know we we preach week after week after week to make sure that you continue to update and you know keith you and i are probably cut from the same cloth if it's not broken don't fix it yet we tell folks we need to update and and this would include all possible software components including updating uefi uh what happens what's that process look like and how Easy or difficult is it to screw up? Because I know I've screwed up my share of uh, BIOS updates on floppy disks, and yeah, that was never a, a good scenario. So, so what what makes UFI different, and what can go wrong in the the update process, or what can go horribly well? Sure. Um, 
So I would say that the first thing that differentiates UEFI from uh, other film architecture is uh, exactly the fact that it is uh, uh, endorsed by a, a special interest group in which uh, a lot of firm, a lot of different companies collaborate together. Into UEFI, we have silicon vendors, uh, we have uh, 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 OEM, we have uh, 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 IHVs, uh, operating system vendor. So uh, all these bright minds uh, work together in order to uh, come up with uh, a, a specification that uh, uh, really uh, differentiate this. Uh, uh, um, that really differentiate uh, uh, this architecture from uh, as an existing architecture because of the uh, interoperability that uh, uh, open up this type of uh, um, uh, uh, that, that open up UEFI itself. So uh, the, the main difference I would say is uh, the fact that uh, uh, we can really uh, uh, um, integrate uh, uh, different uh, um, firmware components uh, and uh, uh, with uh, a much easier uh, um, capability than other uh, firmware architecture. But uh, going in specific to the uh, to your question about updates, uh, I think that uh, uh, UEFI bring us uh, uh, another very important uh, um, uh, capability besides Secure Boot uh, that uh, I could say is one of the st uh, uh, strong uh, uh, point of UEFI itself, that is uh, what we call capsule update. Uh, capsule update is uh, uh, a system that is uh, 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 supported by the UEFI specification itself, uh, in which the operating system can uh, 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 put in memory an image uh, of a capsule including a new firmware image. A new firmware image that uh, uh, can be uh, the entire uh, uh, firmware of the system or can be also, uh, let me say, a, 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 um, a, a, an update of a component like uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the network, uh, uh, the network uh, uh, chip. And uh, then uh, going into uh, uh, sleep mode and exiting from him from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the sleep mode and giving control back to the firmware, the firmware will identify that this uh, 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 capsule has been uh, uh, provided for uh, update purposes and after verifying that uh, uh, the capsule uh, contain uh, an original uh, uh, firmware image, image because uh, uh, of its signature and uh, verifying so that it has not been tampered in any way but is uh, uh, just the original image uh, uh, created by the uh, Maserbal manufacturer, it will proceed, uh, the firmware will proceed and use this image in order to update the uh, um, uh, uh, the. Uh, SPI ROM, uh, SPI flash uh, that uh, uh, contain the uh, uh, firmware for uh, next boot. That's awesome. Uh, uh, you, uh, you are, uh, sorry, Keith, go ahead. I was going to say, just out of curiosity, how big is a firmware image generally uh, in terms of like kilobytes or megabytes? I'm, I'm curious. I imagine they've grown over time. Um, I'd be really interested to know actually like maybe when you started what what size was kind of the firmware image and then maybe what they are now if you have any idea of, as to what that would be. When I started 64k was already a big uh, <laughs> uh, a big size. Uh, we were talking about uh, uh, typically 32k images. Uh, now uh, a small one we could say is typically in the order of the two megabyte, but uh, uh, more normally they are four and eight megabyte. And for complex ser server uh, 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 motherboard can also uh, go uh, e even to uh, 16 megabyte. Gotcha. So that's actually, I mean, by today's standards, it's still pretty small comparative to what, you know, memory and disk space has, has grown to. So. Uh, I imagine that these are probably written in C. Uh, are they written in any other languages as well, or are they all like kind of C-based um, firmware? They, they are all C-based. 
There is still a very little part of assembly language, but I could say is minimal at this point. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent. Keith, you want to take one of our next questions? You're on a roll, buddy. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. So um, I'm, I'm really curious to know, especially given your history with the company, uh, what it's like to work for a company that's so focused on a targeted uh, computing functionality or feature such as, you know, the BIOS in this case. Let me say that I am always being very uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, about uh, uh, system, system software and in specifically, let me say, seeing uh, uh, how the uh, electron moves uh, into the uh, inside the silicon. Uh, so uh, uh, firmware, it is, uh, uh, let me say, the paradise for uh, a, 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 an enthusiast that like to pass his time into a lab uh, to uh, uh, touch uh, every piece of the, uh, uh, of the hardware that is present into the motherboard of the PC. So, uh, and uh, let me say that uh, um, being the foundation and uh, 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 providing, uh, let me say, the services to every kind of operating system and so interacting not only with the hardware vendor, but also with the operating system vendor, make uh, the, uh, 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 this type of, uh, of job very, uh, um, uh, uh, very interesting from my point of view, even if uh, from uh, a, 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 a level of application, it could be very boring. <laughs> I'm curious to know, so uh, staying with the positive side of it, what has been uh, probably the best experience you've had in terms of working with uh, operating system vendors? Is there a specific vendor that you've really enjoyed working with over your, your history with the company? Uh, let me say that uh, I have worked with... Uh, uh, many different uh, uh, operating system vendors, uh, and uh, uh, it is always uh, uh, it is always very uh, interesting the uh, type of uh, uh, collaboration there is. Uh, let me say that UEFI also has brought this uh, uh, interaction to uh, uh, to new levels because. Uh, uh, while uh, before the uh, before UEFI, the end off between the firmware and the operating system practically was uh, a transfer of control, a simple call, nothing more than that. Uh, now the uh, uh, with UEFI, the interaction that there are between the uh, uh, firmware and the operating system are at, at multiple level. For example. Uh, um, let me say that uh, there has been a lot of activity recently at uh, uh, SAPI level in order to introduce uh, a new table in order to uh, provide uh, uh, more uh, information to the operating system in order to how to handle a different hardware component uh, present into the, uh, uh, into the system itself. So that actually um, gets to the next question actually very smoothly, which is uh, I'm curious to know what are some of the advances that have been made in BIOS technology that are significant? And it sounds like one of them is giving more access to the operating system uh, and the hardware that is supporting it. But uh, what other sort of advances have been made in BIOS technology over the course of your career? The advances in BIOS technology, uh, I mean, are uh, on many multiple fronts. So let me say that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, with UEFI networking, uh, uh, becomes uh, a, a very easy uh, uh, task uh, uh, for firmware. While uh, in the, I cannot say that was not possible in the past. I have uh, had experience uh, at the BIOS level with uh, enabling uh, uh, enabling uh, uh, network communication. But surely UEFI make the uh, um, uh, the, the network communication for firmware much easier. Uh, also, the uh, manageability of the platforms uh, have uh, uh, significantly is re has really increased, and uh, uh, so, for example, in, in case of server platform, we now have new uh, initiative that, uh, uh, like Redfish, that are capable of. Uh, uh, let me say, handling the uh, uh, platform configuration in a much smoother way as it was before. Um, so I would say that uh, uh, innovation uh, uh, in firmware has happened uh, in, uh, in, in several different areas. Um, uh, and 
I w don't want to leave out uh, the uh, user interface uh, with a graphical output protocol. Uh, UEFI has standardized the capability to operate uh, in a, a graphical way into the preboot. And we had uh, some very cool projects that we have uh, uh, executed that were uh, including, that were adding graphical support to the preboot environment. Yeah, the, the, the first time I ever got to you know, change any bio settings and I got to use my mouse, I was bored. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, uh, as a follow-up to that question, I, I'm just curious, any of the, the features that you've seen that you really enjoyed working on over time, is there like one or two specific features that you helped to bring forward that you were really proud of having worked on? Uh, manageability. I think that the manageability of platform will, be, uh, will continue to be a very, uh, a very hot topic. And uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, let me say, uh, uh, gone uh, uh, um, uh, um, above and beyond the uh, simple user manageability to a server platform, but we are using the same technology in order to support manageability also in, on the client, uh, on the client space. So uh, the idea practically is uh, uh, to enable uh, uh, IT manager to be able to manage not only the operating system and application, but also the platform from remote, so facilitating the, the work of the IT managers. That's awesome. Excellent. Yeah, these are all these are all things we love to hear. You know, we talk so much about you know updates and being able to manage and do inventory is really critical to a security process. Uh, the you know hearing some of that is just absolutely amazing. You want to know if there is a Thunderbolt system connected, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, a, a question that you know is kind of interesting, and, and you know, now that I get to build some new computers and stuff in the the lab, and um, one of the things that uh, is is different from from seeing this you know, going back into my earlier years, um, we're starting to see less and less of the quote BIOS boot screen from the traditional press F two to enter. Um, why yep. are we not seeing that anymore, and, and what what drove that change? Um, I would say that this is uh, uh, exactly one of those uh, uh, SCPI tables that I was talking before, because operating system vendors have requested uh, uh, to uh, provide uh, what is called uh, uh, um, BGRT, boot graphic, uh, uh, blah, 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 uh, Anyway, is a table that uh, uh, defines to the uh, operating system uh, how the video is, uh, what the video contains in the moment in which we end off from the film to the operating system. And the root of this is because more and more OEM uh, 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 are uh, uh, desiring to put uh, uh, their own logo on the system as soon as it power up. And uh, uh, so that there can be a smooth transition between uh, uh, the, the uh, logo presented by the OEM and the logo presented by Windows uh, as, uh, uh, when the Windows bootloader take, uh, uh, take over. And anyway, talking also about uh, uh, the past that you, are, uh, uh, that you are indicating, let me say that in the past, uh, the uh, time to boot was uh, considerably longer to what is today. Today yes. we are talking only about a few seconds, so uh, um, they, 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 uh, uh, we don't have any longer that uh, uh, this long time in which uh, firmware put something on the, uh, on the screen. Is part of the reason that it, they load so fast, not only because of their size, but also because of things like solid state technology and the, on the disk and so forth, is that part of why they're now so fast? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, um, Rotating disks uh, have been surely uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, few years one of the main reasons of, uh, 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 of the latency uh, during boot. So uh, uh, adoption of solid state disk surely speed up uh, the boot time big time. Excellent, excellent. So taking a little bit step back and to sort of you know, bringing the, the interview a little bit full circle but with a little bonus question at the end there. Um, Looking back at Secure Boot, um, what are some of the challenges folks uh, encounter implementing Secure Boot, and and why do companies potentially uh, are they resistant to implementing Secure Boot, and maybe why are they not doing? It? Um, I mean, I 
Mm, uh, uh, from this point of view, I can uh, uh, speak about uh, 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 our experience in AMI. Mm -hmm. Honestly, we have been uh, uh, practically the, the first company that has uh, uh, put out already in 2012 the capability to uh, uh, handle the, uh, uh, the keys into uh, uh, that control uh, uh, secure, boot, uh, uh, secure boot process. Uh, let me say that uh, uh, um, uh, security is a subject that involves uh, 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 knowledge of uh, uh, um, key technology that uh, uh, you guys are surely uh, extremely expert, but uh, in the uh, traditional uh, um, IT environment is not uh, a type of knowledge that is uh, uh, so, so, frequently, uh, so frequently found. So some challenges could, uh, surely have come from uh, a, a, a a, a, a step up that had to be done by uh, people working into the uh, uh, into this area in order to uh, uh, learn about uh, the, the uh, uh, public key technology. Understood. Understood. So, sort of uh, closing the loop uh, and uh, you know thinking about you know all these great things that. You, that you guys have done with UEFI and some of the great features. What are some of your favorite, what are some of the coolest implementations that you've ever seen of UEFI? Because you could put this really anywhere. What's some of your favorites? Um, I would say that uh, uh, my favorite application in the area of UEFI are in the area of reboot management. Um, there are uh, a uh, very uh, cool solution that uh, uh, you can put together in order to uh, perform a platform management. Uh, and uh, we have worked with several OEMs uh, in terms of uh, uh, providing uh, interfaces to the uh, installers in order to uh, uh, simplify the uh, uh, process of deployment of uh, new platform in the field with uh, a feature that go from uh, 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 let me say, uh, a, a, a more uh, a easy uh, firmware update uh, or uh, migration of configuration between multiple systems so that if you have a number of systems that, uh, 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 that are similar, you can just uh, uh, configure one and extract the configuration and apply the same uh, to all the other systems that uh, uh, you have bought of the same, uh, uh, of the same type. And uh, uh, also, we have also uh, uh, provided capability to simplify the uh, installation of the operating system, uh, creating solutions into the UEFI, that, the, into the uh, UEFI preboot environment that make use of uh, uh, the scripted capability of uh, practically any OS nowadays uh, uh, to uh, 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 execute the uh, OS installation and triggering this directly from the, the, uh, um, uh, from the UEFI uh, environment. That's, that, that, uh, that is really cool. <laughs> uh, having, having done lots of uh, sysadmin type work in the, in the past and been involved with you know, security issues in, in many organizations, you know, being able to do that in a repeatable process over and over again, especially when you have something new and having a known quantity that is configured by the, the operating system users or sysadmins uh, uh, in a secure state out of the box, that is, that's an amazing thing to be able to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the uh, IT manager is really our, our, our main target because uh, uh, you need to remember that BIOS uh, uh, is good if the user of the system doesn't know about it. So uh, really the, the, the only uh, people that are making a real uh, 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 complete use are the, the, uh, 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 the IT managers or the users that uh, operate as IT manager inside their families, inside their groups. So we really want to target our solution to uh, this type of uh, uh, to to uh, enable a larger base of uh, uh, people to perform uh, this type of action and then disappear because that is what we need to do as well. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. 
Keith, any uh, any other questions uh, before we uh, before we conclude? No, this has been this has been excellent. I mean, honestly, from my experience being a, a kid growing up in the '90s who did all sorts of fun stuff with hardware because you had to to actually boot up certain you know uh, operating systems and what have you. It's it's amazing to think about and, and speak with someone who has helped make so many strides in our industry and in computing in general. So honestly, thank you for coming on the show. And I know that we probably have some additional questions, Larry, that we may be asking. But uh, this has been excellent. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much, guys. Sir, thank thank you for uh, for appearing on Security Weekly, and uh, we hope to have you back again soon. Absolutely, thank you very much. Thank you. And with Everybody. that, on to our tech segment. <laughs> 